Hi, everyone. Uh, so my name is Rachel Sibley. I'm the uh, automotive um, uh, QE technical lead for the automotive program uh, at Red Hat. Um, and here with me is Priyanka Verma, who also works with me on the initiative. Um, so we're going to talk to you today about how to qualify a safe Linux distribution in cars. Um, so a little bit about the agenda. Um, I'll talk about what is the Red Hat in-vehicle operating system and safe Linux, our overall approach to safe Linux, and how we're working towards compliance against the ISO 26262. Um, we'll go into what is the test strategy like, um, freedom from interference, um, failure mode and effects analysis, the process aspect of it and how we're managing the requirements based on man pages, and um, test assets and traceability um, and the work items that go into that. Uh, so what is the in-vehicle operating system? Uh, it's a uh, smaller footprint of RHEL. Um, we are inheriting everything from RHEL except the kernel. The kernel is the only package we're rebuilding uh, for hardware enablement. Um, we're using the RT kernel. It's based on OS tree. Um, which is very common with running uh, OS tree and embedded systems. Uh, we're working to achieve functional safety certification uh, to conform to the ISO standard. Uh, it wasn't really made for pre-existing complex software, but there is a, an initiative to adapt the ISO uh, 26262 through an ISO pass to, to complement that better. So we're working with a company or a partner, um, Exida, consulting body, and they're helping us with achieving uh, continuous certification for FUSA. So what is uh, FUSA, or functional safety? Uh, it's the absence of unreasonable risk that could lead to harm or injury or even death later on, on, later on in, in the road, in the vehicle. So we want to ensure that we did everything in our power to avoid potential harm to uh, the user. So by doing that, there's compliance against this international standard. We have safety goals where th that are derived from potential hazards. We, we provide technical solutions to be able to react to these faults. A uh, big part of it is it's very process oriented, very rigorous, detailed flow to be able to work towards um, a functional safety certification. So. Um, uh, yeah, a big aspect of it is providing the evidence uh, so that if we get pulled into court later on or there's an audit, we have the evidence uh, to be able to back up to say, yes, we did what we claimed that we were doing and we set out to do, and we have the evidence to back it up. So you might hear the term ASIL a lot um, throughout the talk. Uh, ASIL stands for Automotive Safety Integrity Levels. Uh, low, uh, A be, being the lowest level, uh, up through D, which is the highest level of a hazard. Uh, so ASIL A would be something like your rear light, um, which is very unlikely that's going to cause somebody to um, be in an accident and become harmed in any way, where you look at something like um, uh, ASIL D, which is the airbags failing to deploy. Um, so this is a, 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 a high level view of like the different capabilities in the car and how they would relate to the ASIL levels. For us, we're certifying against ASIL B. So ASILs are determined by three factors, uh, probability of exposure, controllability by the driver, and the severity of the failure. So this slide has a lot going on, but I'll try to summarize it. So the ISO um, throughout the specification mentions the V model quite often. Uh, this is the verification and validation uh, process. It's uh, derived from the waterfall model. This isn't something we typically follow within RELQE. Um, so we take what we're already doing well um, and complement it with the various aspects into this V model. The safety analysis is really what um, identifies how complex and how much rigor we really put into this. And these are the, the FMEA um, analysis, the failure modes and effects analysis, uh, which Priyanka will get into a little bit later on. So on the left side is the verification activities where we do our system design and requirements analysis. And then on the right side, we're doing our iterative testing at the unit level, uh, integration, system level, and so forth. 
So um, for the in-vehicle OS, we're leveraging all of the same tests from RHEL. They're already doing a really good job there. We don't want to um, duplicate the effort there. They are, and they also take a lot of the tests from their upstream, uh, RHEL being our upstream, and then further upstream and for, so forth. So we take all of those tests and we rerun them in our environment, which is uh, an OS tree environment, also working on adapting the tests to a new test framework. Um, the tests weren't really designed to work against an RPM traditional compose, so there's a little bit of work to work with uh, an OS tree um, system. So because of the aspect of not being able to write and not using DNF, we we're using RPM OS tree and so forth. Um, and then there's additional work to adapt to the test framework to get them to run in our CI systems. So the requirements are derived from the AZLB APIs. So um, for each of these APIs, we needed to derive test cases, have targeted tests or t that are 100% covering the requirements, um, which I'll talk about in a little bit. But for the, where we want to be able to reuse the technologies and tooling um, within um, RHEL QE, um, we don't want to fork their tests and we don't want to duplicate what they're already doing well uh, and be able to reuse those technologies. So we have two main pipelines where we're running our tests. Um, one is the Auto Tool Chain CI pipeline. This is specific to automotive with building custom images um, and rerunning in the pipeline. Um, and then we use the, we're, we're, we're reusing Testing Farm and TMT. There were other talks about that um, earlier. You might have attended those. Um, but TMT stands for Test Management Tool and highly used within um, RHEL QE. And then CKI is. Um, uh, the kernel CI effort that is going on in Red Hat. Uh, they have high engagement with the upstream kernel community with testing upstream kernel trees. So they have a, they test very um, early in the development cycle at the patch level and we want to be able to reuse that as well. And then the other effort is uh, being able to provide the traceability in Polarian which complies with the ISO standard. So for requirements testing, um, we have the package level verification, and this has to happen per API level. Um, a lot of, there's a very detailed workflow that goes into this, which starts with reviewing code reviews and static code analysis, um, structural coverage, so the code coverage analysis, the requirements level verification, which is derived from the man page of the API. We then take an API, man, we take, then we take a, a man page and we break it down into uh, low level requirements. So we are able to break that down into something more, um, that's maybe something that's ambiguous. We break it down into testable parts to ensure that we have the traceability for all the behavior that's, that are specified in the man page. And then if we find any um, discrepancies with the man page, it's also a chance for us to be able to file uh, a merge request uh, to be able to provide those changes to make sure that the specification, uh, e.g. man page, is actually doing what um, the implementation uh, is designed for. So the integration level testing, um, this comes out of the uh, safety analysis, which I mentioned earlier. So the failure modes, uh, effects and analysis, where there are specific failure modes that are identified um, within an API and exter external syscalls um, and dependencies, and we need to ensure that our existing package level testing is already covering the uh, integration level testing as well. And then again, more uh, details about um, putting that into Polarian, adding the requirements. We need to have the requirements linked to test cases and um, test cases to test runs and so forth. So um, uh, Priyanka will talk about that a little bit. Uh, so I talked about code coverage analysis earlier. So the ISO recommends the software is verified using code coverage analysis. Uh, the target is 100% compliance for the recommended uh, quality metrics defined in the specification. Um, we don't have to do this for every API, only for the complex APIs. For We also use it to assist us with the simple APIs to ensure that we have the 100% requirements coverage. So within the specification, you'll see um, recommended, highly recommended for all of the techniques within the V model. Um, so for the code coverage, structural coverage, it's, it's recommending both statement and branch coverage. Um, 
in. So for code coverage workflows, we're trying to do more granular reports that are specific to the API level, rather than running against the entire package source, uh, be able to do um, detailed analysis where we can drill down into specific API to see where our gaps are. Um, so the low level requirements also have code coverage analysis that are showing the, uh, the traceability of the tests uh, to the requirements and the test coverage there. So that helps us understand where are gaps with code coverage and requirements and therefore requirements coverage to know, well, I need to go and develop new tests and then push them upstream to be able to pull them back down to, to row. So another major aspect of functional safety for road vehicles is freedom from interference. Freedom from interference is about absence of cascading failures. As we can see in the image, the cascading failure is the failure that actually cascades from one element to another. So for example, there was an event that causes a fault in element A, which made the element A fail. And the failure of element A causes the fault in element B and it fails the element B. So this is a cascading failure. So freedom from interference is majorly about avoiding the cascading failures. So it's also linked to the easel that is there should be freedom from interference between lower and higher ASILs or a quality managed level to, uh, to any ASIL A, B, C, or D. So how do we ensure freedom from interference? First thing, we analyze. So there is DFA, dependent failure analysis. So this covers uh, the cascading failures, which are for the freedom from interference, and then also the common cause failures, which are related to the independence. So common cause failure, as the name suggests, it is due to a common cause that at the same time fails element A and element B. So these failure analysis help us uh, you know, figure out the failure modes that could lead to the failures and we try to mitigate those failures. Again, these dependent failure analysis are of two categories. One is deductive analysis and the another one is inductive analysis. So as Rachel mentioned that we are targeting ASIL B. So according to the functional safety standard for road vehicles, uh, for ASIL B, it's highly recommended to do inductive analysis, which is FMEA failure mode and effect analysis. So under this exercise, what we do is we brainstorm and list the failure modes that could be applicable to a particular component. And then further analysis happens where we calculate the risk priority number. So risk priority number is nothing but the multiplication of severity, occurrence, and detectability. So we get that number uh, after the multiplication, and then we have the data for the failure mode. Now comes the chance of mitigating that failure. So we apply technical solutions to mitigate the failure that we have already listed in the FMEA. So after putting that medication, again the risk priority number is calculated and it's checked if, it is, uh, it, if it's under the acceptable range or not. And from the mitigations, then finally uh, there is one more way of deriving requirements that is through failure modes that comes into picture. Now comes the process aspect. So process aspect is majorly about the evidence and then the traceability. So evidence is that we have to prove that we did what we, uh, what we were supposed to do according to the functional safety standard. We have to prove that we tested a requirement or we made sure the failure mode was covered with the mitigations and we followed all the timelines, the fault time tolerance interval and a lot of more things. So these evidences could be uh, for testing, for QE, it could be our test asset, it could be, it could be our test plan, uh, test specification and our test reports that tell us when we tested the requirement, how we tested the requirement, what techniques were used and what methods were used and what were the results, which tools we used. So we have all the data if we want to retrieve. And along with all the data, this data needs to be traceable. So we should be able to make out which test is for which requirement and which result is for which requirement, whether the failure mode 
has the right requirement associated to it or it was it tested well, was it 100% tested or partially tested. So that kind of data should be traceable. So yeah, that's, that's traceability is one of the things that add value to the evidence. And evidence which is not traceable is not valuable. So how do we achieve it? We are doing it by using Polarian. We are using Polarian in different ways, as you can see, for our test case management, for writing our technical safety concept, managing our requirements, and something that's in progress is the configuration management, tracking our change requests, whether they are related to the tools, the process, or the requirements. And lastly, we are using it for the metric reports, like the traceability metrics, and uh, also the pass-fail metrics according to the requirement. Now we come into how do we derive the low-level requirements and the associated conditions of use. So as Rachel previously said, that we are taking reference from the man pages of the associated API, APIs that are in the safety scope. So first we analyze the man page, and from that man page we derive the low-level requirements that are testable. And now there are other things that come into picture that are assumptions or the conditions of use. These assumptions of use or conditions of use come into picture when the fulfillment of these low-level safety requirements is dependent on the context. For example, I define a requirement for an API, but that holds true only if my system is 64-bit. So that is going to be my assumption of use that the so-and-so requirement should be verified at end passes because if you use the right environment. So that's the assumptions or conditions of use. Later, yes, the verification happens and yeah, that's how we move forward. Next thing, when we talk about man pages for deriving requirements, the, one, the first thought that comes into mind is man pages are subject to change because they're upstream, right? So how do we detect and handle those changes? So we have an application that runs and gives us the diff if there is a change, and then there is a CI that's automatically triggered and MR is raised. And there the analysis happened where, uh, which tells us that whether the change is related to the API in our safety scope or not. If it's not in our safety scope, it automatically gets merged. And if it is in our safety, uh, if not in safety scope, it's automatically merged, and if it's in safety scope, then uh, the MR is pending for review. So what happens when there is an MR pending to review due to a change? Then our change management workflow comes into picture. A change request is opened, and then the impact analysis take place. In that impact analysis, we take into account the technical impact, the schedule impact, and what are the different work products that will be impacted due to this change, whether it affects only documentation or testing or testing development and documentation. So that kind of impact analysis is performed. Based on that impact analysis, there's a change control board that approves or rejects the change. So once the board approves the change of the man page, the related requirement uh, gets the change of text, and hence the implementation changes, and hence followed by the uh, VNV activities, that is validation and verification activities. Now, the traceability aspect, how does it fit in in the complete scenario? So we have low level safety requirements, we have failure modes, we have man page based requirements. And for traceability needs according to the functional safety standard, we need to have bi-directional traceability between the different hierarchical levels of the requirement. For example, if I'm at the lower level requirement, I should be able to trace back to the top level or the parent requirement, and from there I should be able to come back to the related or derived low level requirement. And hence, the requirement should also be traceable with the test specifications that are verifying that requirement, the test results, and hence the test plans and test report. Basically, all of our test assets. And same goes for the failure modes. So our failure modes should also be traceable according to what test plan they were planned in, and the test specification reports and more. So this is an example traceability report, how it finally looks like. So what you see here at the top level is the man page based requirement, and which is further associated to the low level requirements that it has, the failure modes, 
that are in the blue icon over there, and that exclamation mark is for the assumptions or conditions of use. And below that, if you see, there is the low-level requirement associated with the test case. So we see that which test case is verifying which requirement and how the requirements are you know, related to or bidirectionally traceable to the failure modes. So that's an example. Any questions? Yes, please. Like, does the standard, uh, it applies both to failure modes in software only, or it can apply to failure modes uh, that software can cause in hardware? Yes, actually the standard incorporates at, uh, it has, it is for all three levels, at the software level, the hardware, and the system level, which is software plus hardware. So currently here, we are concentrating on the software part for now, and maybe in future, if it, uh, if it, you know, does life cycle permits, then, yeah, hardware and software interfacing HSI. Yes, please. Uh, which tool are you covering uh, coverage analysis? Like GCOV or Severity? Yeah, GCOV. Yeah, and GCOV R as well. Okay. Uh, which, the question was which tool are we, we using for code coverage analysis? Uh, GCOV, GCOV R. Um, Yes. Are you going to contribute to test such or developing the Yeah, a lot of the work that we're doing um, for the safety scope, like a big part of it is affecting glibc package, for example. So there's a very large upstream test suite that we're rerunning re uh, for Rivos, and then we're trying to break it apart by the unit level to show the traceability to the specific failure mode or the specific um, package level test against the API. So new tests are being developed, and they're being staged, and we're in coordination with the SMEs about how to be able to upstream those tests um, uh, to the glibc project because then rel qe can take advantage of that and then pull them back down and rerun them for rel as well Uh, the question, yeah, the question was how we create this requirement hierarchy with the high level requirements with the man page and then low level. So there's even more levels actually beyond that. There's the technical software safety requirements um, that are d uh, defined from our safety goals and then they tr trickle down to our man page requirements which go to the a API like get env and then from the API uh, get env we then look at the man page and then um, we look at the, the behaviors within the man page and then break it down into functional parts because not every part of the man page is something that you would test, for example. So those become low-level requirements and then those get fed into code coverage analysis to show that we have 100% uh, code coverage against those low-level requirements. Um, but now we might not always get 100% code coverage. Um, so as long as we can provide justification as to why that uh, code path wasn't reached, for example, that's allowed. But otherwise, for the complex R R APIs, we have to have 100% code coverage. Yeah, the, this, uh, where do we get our requirements from? Uh, the, the, A the APIs, which are our AZLB APIs, those come from the OEM. So they provide the list of APIs within the safety scope. Of course, we work with them to influence them and help them guide them about which ones should be in the safety scope. Um, but those specifically, yeah, come from our customer, which is GM, who we're working with right now. Uh, 
so the, the question was some of the man pages are very minimum and then re they point to other documentation. Was that the question? Um, if it's, we will have to handle that, yes. Uh, it, it, well, there's this syscall wrappers and that sort of thing. Um, so yeah, that's something that we need to handle. And um, it's, yeah, so part of it will be redirected back to the actual uh, API that's um, wrapping around it. So there's different use cases based on if it's like a syscall wrapper or um, the API or, um, and then there's different categories of very complex, complex, high, medium, low, and there's different rigor that's taken upon uh, the complexity of the API as well. But eventually those are gonna be broken down into two aspects, simple and complex, um, once we get to a point uh, where we can do that classification. All right, well, thank you very much.